Father, I pray that you would steady our hearts as oftentimes when you, when you study narratives, you come across stories that are one thought frame, but it's just really long and hard to break up to two or three different sermons. And I pray that as we endure uh, reading your word today, you would give us the attention that we need and that our hearts would treat it with the reverence that it deserves because this is a form of you condescending to us and giving us truths in the form of human language that human brains can understand, eternal truths that really we can't grasp fully um, unless we use uh, the faculties in which you have gifted us with, including the cognitive faculties. And I pray as we um, uh, put in the effort of doing that, you would be gracious and remind us uh, that your spirit is, is, is kind and merciful enough to reveal things in our hearts even when our minds miss it. And I beg you, spirit, that you would come and that you would illuminate these truths in the hearts of poor sinners like us who oftentimes um, can't grasp it. Be now with Joe as he preaches. Renew your people. Build up your church for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading today is taken from Acts 13, verse 13 to 52. Hear the word of God. Paul and Barnabas at Antioch in Pisidia. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with hand, his hands, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with uplifted arm he led them out of it. And for about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them the, their lands as an inheritance. All this took about four hundred and fifty years. And after that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God them, gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 days, 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent a message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterance of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled, in, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and from, for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he, had, he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, 
he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy land, the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But the Jews saw the crowds, They were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvations to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of the high standings and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Thus saith the Lord. Thank you, Aldo. Let me pray for us before we get into God's word. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to come before you and your people, Lord, and to hear your word being preached. We pray, Lord, that you would make it effective to our hearts, that you would use your word, Lord, to change our lives, to change it on a daily basis, Lord, to make us more and more like Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord, for the great redemption and salvation in him. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Our passage uh, this morning, friends, uh, contains a sermon that was preached by the Apostle Paul. And as you can see, it's one of the longest sermons that's recorded in the book of Acts. And really, the only time, I think, that we're given insight into the contents of the message of Paul. Generally, we'll only hear that he preached the gospel. But now we're, we're getting some meat and content to what it was, exactly what it was that Paul preached. Now, Paul and Barnabas have traveled to a city called Pisidian Antioch. And because of its economic prosperity, this city was very ethnically diverse. And it included various people groups like the Galatians, Phrygians, the Greeks, the Jews, and many Roman soldiers as well. So you could imagine that Pisidian Antioch would have had all the typical uh, Roman architecture and uh, pagan altar statues and Roman emperors on display as well. So in our passage today, we, we learn that after Paul and Barnabas arrived in this city, they went to a synagogue that was filled with Jews and Gentiles. And after the service was over, Paul and Barnabas were asked by the rulers of the synagogue if they had any words of encouragement for the people who were present. 
And not surprisingly, however, Paul used this moment as an opportunity to preach the gospel in the providence of God to people who had not yet heard it, to proclaim the good news of salvation in Christ. And so as he began to preach an entire sermon to them, I think it's important for us to understand that the common theme throughout Paul's sermon was the sovereignty of God, the absolute sovereignty of God over all of human history, especially with regards to salvation in Christ. And this is very important for us today as well, because as Reformed Christians, sometimes you and I are accused of using the sovereignty of God as an excuse to not evangelize, right? People say, well, if you believe in the sovereignty of God, in election, like you Reformed folks claim, then why should you evangelize? God has really chosen a people for salvation beforehand. You see, sometimes some people see God's election of certain people for salvation. They think that it sort of eliminates the need for those people to be evangelized. But as we'll see in the sermon that's preached by Paul, uh, God's electing people for salvation actually works hand in hand with our evangelizing them as Christians. In fact, you could even argue that our belief in election should be the very thing that motivates us as believers because we know that our God uses means to accomplish his purposes. He uses the means of witnessing and preaching to call his elect out of darkness and into the light of salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with that being said, I want us to focus on three elements of Paul's gospel presentation, three elements of his gospel presentation. First, the sovereignty of God in human history in verses 16 through 22, and then the sovereignty of God in the fulfillment of his promise, verse 23 through 29, and then the sovereignty of God in the power of the gospel, verses 42 through 48. But first, the sovereignty of God in human history was a major theme in Paul's gospel presentation to these people who were in the synagogue. Verses 16 through 22 says that Paul stood up and motioned with his hand, saying, Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years, and after that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart who will do all my will. (laughs) Um, Have you ever read a history book? Right? If you've ever read a history book, you'll notice that the vast majority of these books are written from the perspective of men. That is, they make reference to the accomplishments of certain peoples or people groups in history alone without any reference to God. Now, in their minds, man and not God is the major player in human history. They do this because they believe that human history centers on the actions and influence of men in the world. Men like Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, or Winston Churchill, or even certain nations like uh, Rome, Egypt, or even England. But you'll notice that Paul doesn't begin his interpretation of history by focusing on the actions or influence of any specific person or nation, no. He doesn't even focus on the Israelites. Rather, Paul begins his interpretation of history by focusing on the actions and influence of God in the world. Why? Because Paul understood that behind the actions of every individual person and nation is the sovereign purpose of God. And so for Paul, all of human history really is his story right? It's God's story because history centers on God himself and not just the actions of men. 
because it is God who is working in us and through us. He works in and through the actions of men in order to accomplish all of his good purposes in Christ. And that's what Paul wants us to all to see today, friends. And so he begins this sermon by pointing out 11 different instances of God's action in history. Beginning in verse 16, he tells the Jews how God chose their fathers and made the people great by leading them out of Egypt where he, God, bore with them in the wilderness. He then talks about how it was God who destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan and gave them their land as an inheritance. How he, God, gave them judges and how he, God, when they had asked for a king, gave them Saul. And notice that it says also that it was God who removed Saul from kingship and then God who raised up David. And then finally, Paul says, God has brought Israel a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he had promised from the beginning. You see, taken all together, these verses cover well over a thousand years of redemptive history from the book of Genesis to the coming of Christ. And notice that it's, it's God who's the subject of history and not man. God, who is the subject of almost all the verbs that Paul uses in this verses as well. It's almost as if Paul purposely overlooks the influence of human beings in order to emphasize the actions of God for us. You see, what Paul wanted us all to understand is that God is absolutely sovereign over all of human history. And this was so important to Paul that he felt the need to emphasize this fact to everyone who was present when Paul preached his sermon. And verse 16 tells us that there were mostly Jews who were there, but also some Gentile God-fearers who were present at the time, right? I mean, think about it for a minute. When you tell people as a Christian about your own personal history, do you say, God did this or God did that? No, you usually emphasize the things that you did, right? Or the choices that you made as a person. I mean, even when we evangelize people and tell them about how we came to Christ, we usually emphasize our part in it, right? We talk about how we repented of sin and how we believed in Christ and so on. And that's okay. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that at all. We're not under any obligation whatsoever to emphasize the sovereignty of God when we evangelize to other people. And neither was Paul. You see, the point is that Paul intentionally chose to preach this way. He made a conscious effort to teach the sovereignty of God in history because he wanted everyone to know that the goal for every sinner in human history is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. To know and understand that all of human history points to him and his work of redemption on behalf of sinners. And Paul was talking to a group of people in the synagogue that very day who were mostly unbelievers. People who lived in different cultures and had different philosophies and beliefs about the world than Paul did. So part of what he was trying to do was to show them a different way of looking at the world. A kind of way that sets the stage for the coming of Christ, which was the single most important event in human history, friends. And so as sinners, we should do, I think, everything we can to look to the Lord Jesus Christ while there is time to be reconciled to the Lord Jesus Christ through faith. He has made reconciliation for us through his life, death, and resurrection. Is there any one of you, friends, here today who has not embraced the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior? And if you are here today, are you truly trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Do you realize that every event that's occurred during your brief time here or on earth has been sovereignly orchestrated by God in order to point you and orient you towards the salvation that he has graciously provided in his son. God's sovereignty in human history. And that brings us to our second point, which is God's sovereignty over the fulfillment of his promise. 
Now, there's two specific promises that God made to his people in the Old Testament. One was that the Messiah would be the offspring of King David. And the other was that the Messiah would suffer a physical death and be bodily raised again from the dead, resurrected. And so beginning in verse 23, Paul shows us how, according to Scripture, as the offspring of King David, Jesus, in fact, was the true Messiah. Speaking of King David, there he says, of this man, of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus Christ, as he promised. You see, Paul's goal here was to prove that Jesus was the true offspring of David, uh, who was foretold by the prophets. And not only was Jesus the true offspring of David, but Paul also pointed out how Jesus fulfilled several other prophecies that were written about him in the Old Testament. For example, in verses 27 through 29, Paul explains to us how the Messiah would be rejected, condemned by men, and finally be put to death on a tree in fulfillment of the very word of God. Paul then moves on to the resurrection, where he quotes scripture as a witness in order to prove that the Bible always taught the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ. And so he quotes three separate passages in the Old Testament in order to prove the resurrection. Psalm 2, Isaiah 55, and Psalm 16. Now, I think we have to ask ourselves, uh, why did Paul go through all this trouble in order to prove the doctrine of the resurrection? Why was the resurrection such an important part of Paul's gospel presentation to these Jews and Gentile unbelievers? Well, because the resurrection, friends, is the very heartbeat, right, of the gospel message. In fact, you could argue that the resurrection of Christ itself is the single most important event in human history. Because it not only proved that Jesus was the promised Messiah in the Old Testament, but it was also God's personal stamp of approval on the ministry of Jesus, on his work on behalf of sinners, because it demonstrated for us that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, on behalf of you and me. See, apart from the resurrection, you and I, friends, have absolutely no hope as sinners of a future existence with God where righteousness will fully and finally prevail one day. And that's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Christ has not been raised, then our faith is in vain and we're still in our sins and those who are most to be pitied in the world. You see, the resurrection of Christ assures us that our bodies of, as believers, friends, will not remain dead, but will one day be raised to eternal life. And that means that all of our labor, friends, here on earth that we do for God's kingdom, all of our labor will never be in vain. So as Christians, our belief in the reality of the resurrection is extremely important for us. And we should... We should all uh, be definitely impacted by the way we live our lives on earth, as well as the way we treat our bodies, knowing that one day they'll be raised again and rescued from corruption. And that's why concerning the resurrection, Paul said, the body that is sown perishable will be raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, but will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but will be raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but will be raised a spiritual body. See, the fact that our bodies will be one day be raised, friends, means that we should definitely value physical things here on earth, right? Things that God has given us and placed in our dominion as believers. As Christians, I think we should, we should genuinely care for the creation as well as our physical bodies. And I know that, that some of us might not like our bodies at some times, right? We wished we looked a different way, or we were born in a different place and time. Some of us wish we were taller or shorter, or even had a different body type or shape than we currently have now. Perhaps there are even some of us who secretly wish that we were born in a different family, a culture, or born of a different ethnicity. 
<laughs> Believe me, I, I completely understand. But the fact is that God has sovereignly blessed all of us here today with the physical bodies that we all have. He has decided the height, the weight, the time, and the place and ethnicity for all of us. And friends, God never makes mistakes. He never does. You see, you're just right. You're perfect as you are because you were created for who to be who God wanted you to be as people. Now, in verses 38 and 39, Paul shows us why it was necessary for Jesus to die and be raised again. There he says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes. Now, here in verse 38, Paul introduces the good news to us of the gospel message itself, that forgiveness of sins comes to sinners through faith in Christ, right? That's what Paul means by the word believes in this passage, right? Those who have faith. And notice the words uh, everyone and everything in verse 39. And by him, that is Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be free from by the law of Moses. So you see the word everyone speaks to the all-inclusive nature of the kingdom of God, right? It really brings out the fullness for us of God's plan of salvation for sinners so that all people, without distinction, whether old or young, whether rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will have their sins forgiven. Similarly, the word everything speaks to the all-inclusive nature of the forgiveness of sins through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This means that all sins without distinction are forgiven in Christ, whether they be sins of omission or sins of commission, whether they be sins we committed in the past, sins that we committed in the present or future, they are all forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ, completely washed away by his precious blood. Friends, what a great salvation this is that's revealed to us in God's word. What a great blessing it is to have redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, I hope that you have trusted in Christ, that your sins have been forgiven through his work on your behalf, that you've trusted in him alone for salvation and not your own ability to keep God's laws by yourself apart from Christ. Friends, if you haven't yet embraced Christ as Savior, I urge you to not delay any longer. The time is short. Because like those in Paul's day, the word of God has come to us, right? All of us have been blessed to hear the word of God being faithfully proclaimed on a weekly basis. And therefore, all of us are commanded to respond if we're ever going to be saved. God's sovereignty in the fulfillment of his promise. And our third and final point is God's sovereignty in the power of the gospel message. God's sovereignty in the power of the gospel message. Look at verses 42 and 43 with me. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue on in the grace of God. So right after Paul had finished his sermon, the word of God has such a great impact and effect on those who heard it that they were literally begging Paul to hear more of it. They loved it. And so they pleaded with Paul to come back in a week so that they could hear him preach again. Most likely, they wanted the opportunity probably to ask Paul some questions so that they can learn even more about the gospel itself. What's even more amazing, though, is the fact uh, that their love for the gospel, think about this, their love for the gospel came from nothing but a clear exposition by the Apostle Paul of the Word of God and nothing else. You see, according to the text, there were no, no miracles that Paul performed. Um, neither did Paul need any fancy equipment or 
state-of-the-art technology to attract people to the Word of God. Uh, nor was the synagogue equipped with a, a, a theater or a musical entertainment or some uh, fancy band to manipulate the emotions of the people who were there in order to persuade them to turn to Christ. Why not? Because Paul himself trusted the power of the word to accomplish all of God's good purposes. You see, the impact of Paul's preaching came purely from a faithful exposition of Scripture because God's Word itself, friends, is invested with His power. The Gospel is the power of God, Romans 1 says, for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Gentile. And friends, if we want to have a similar impact on the place and environment that God has placed us, we must all today be fully confident in God's word. And we must be confident that it will never return to him void, but that it will always accomplish his purpose. Whether that means we're evangelizing someone here in Indonesia or talking and evangelizing someone who lives abroad or at our places of work. We should all trust the power of God's word and learn how to faithfully proclaim it as Christians. Especially because we know that God is at work presently in the world, drawing people to Christ by opening their eyes to the message of the gospel. And without this drawing, friends, no one would ever come to Christ on their own. And that's why Jesus says, no one can, has the ability to come to me, except the Father who sent me would draw that person, right? You see, it's God who must do the drawing. He must open the sinner's eyes and give him a new heart if he is ever to be saved. And you say, wait a minute, Joe. What then is our part as believers? What part do we play in seeing people come to Christ? Well, as I mentioned before, God uses means to accomplish his good purposes, right? Just like he used the faithful preaching of the Apostle Paul in our passage today, right? God uses our prayers, our evangelism, and our obedience to his commands in powerful ways, brothers and sisters, to open the eyes of those who are blind to the truth of the gospel. And so as Christians... This means that we actually have a very important part to play in leading people to Christ. We just have to be faithful wherever it is that God has placed us. And so Peter says to always be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within you as believers. And personally, friends, I find that the sovereignty of God uh, to be very freeing to me as an individual Christian, as I evangelize others, right? It's freeing to me because you know, I don't have to do something extraordinary to get people to believe the gospel message. If I did, I would feel as though I were burdened with this guilt of being ineffective all the time, right? But I don't because I believe in the sovereignty of God. I know that he uses means, right? So in the final analysis, it's God who must change the heart whenever and however he pleases. Paul, I think, understood this fact better than anyone because a week later, when he and Barnabas returned to the synagogue, verses 44 and 45 tells us that the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. So the synagogue was filled to capacity and myriads of people were gathering together to hear the word of God. The Jews who were there were so filled with jealousy that they not only began to contradict the teaching and words of Paul, but they also called him names and insulted him in order to embarrass him and undermine his confidence in his own testimony. I don't know if something like that has ever happened to any of you here today when you were witnessing to other people, but it's definitely not a good feeling when it does happen to any of us as Christians. And it certainly didn't feel good for the Apostle Paul either. But I think that it's very important for us to understand that there will be 
certain people, when we evangelize to them, when we're trying our best to be obedient to God's commands, to spread the gospel message, there will be certain people who will reject the gospel that we proclaim as Christians. They'll take offense to it, right? They might even insult us, call us names, and exclude us from their company. And this hurts. This kind of thing is never easy for us to go through, friends. I don't like it myself. But I think it's critical that we all understand beforehand that if we're living faithfully for the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will most likely suffer some form of persecution from time to time. This is why Jesus reminds us that if they hated me, he says, they will also hate you, that is us, as his followers as well. And so how do we respond when people reject us, reject the message that we proclaim and treat us badly as Christians for doing nothing but loving them with the gospel message? How do we respond? What do we do when we're confronted with opposition as we evangelize? Well, I think according to our text today, we seek other opportunities. Notice the words of Paul in verses 46 and 47. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. But since you judge yourselves, uh, thrust it aside, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold... We are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. You see, here in his discouragement, in the midst of his discouragement, Paul turns again to the word of God and quotes Isaiah 49, which is a prophecy about Christ being a light to the Gentiles. In other words, Paul is not letting their rejection of the gospel Keep him from doing what it is that he feels that God has called him to do as a believer. In fact, he turns to the scriptures and takes courage in the fact that even their rejection of the gospel is in the sovereignty of God. Even their rejection of the gospel that he so faithfully proclaimed to them was actually foretold beforehand. In other words, Paul understood that God is absolutely sovereign and always accomplishes his good purposes, even, friends, when people reject the gospel message, that gracious invitation that God so graciously gives to them. Because in spite of the rebellion of the Jews, the Gentiles who were there who heard Paul's message were savingly and lovingly brought to faith by God. Verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many were appointed to eternal life, believe. Did you get that? And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believe. You see the sovereignty of God, that those who were appointed to eternal life believed. Now, you would think it would be the other way around, right? that you first believe, and then you're appointed to eternal life. But it's actually just the opposite. You see, the truth is that behind all of our teaching, behind all of our witnessing, behind all of our praying, behind all of our fasting, uh, is the glorious doctrine of election. That ultimately, the only reason that any of us ever repent of our sins and believe the gospel message is because God has appointed us or predestined us to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's written our names in his very own book of life so that when the message of the gospel comes to us, he opens our eyes and transforms our hearts from hearts of stone, brothers and sisters, to hearts of flesh. Hearts that embrace the gospel message. Hearts that believe the truth of God as we accept the gospel in a moment of time. We're actually being granted eternal life by God. That life that was appointed for us in eternity. What an amazing truth this is. And so as Christians, our salvation is not at all inconsistent 
with us being evangelized, nor is it inconsistent with us evangelizing other people. Because the Bible teaches the sovereignty of God that works in and through the actions of men in the presentation of the gospel message. God opens the eyes of our hearts and grants all of us faith. Friends, did you know that the average cost of a physical heart transplant is well over a million dollars? And yet, ironically, the best heart tra transplant that you could ever receive, the most important heart transplant that you could ever receive, is the one that's given to you by God. It's actually a spiritual heart transplant, heart transplant the kind that comes graciously and freely from God. And the good news is you don't have to pay anything for it. It's absolutely free. It will cost you nothing because God has promised it to everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you are sovereign. Thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign over human history and over the evil actions of men. Lord, even in our day, we're plagued by evil all around us, Lord. There's currently a war taking place, Lord. Currently, things that we are dealing with, Lord, at our workplaces and in our homes. Things, Lord, that we have no control over, but we know that you do. And so we thank you, Lord, that you're sovereign and that all things work for our good as believers. We thank you, Lord, that you have elected us in Christ from before the foundation of the world so that we could never lose our salvation. We thank you, Lord, that when we evangelize, we are not alone, but you are with us, Lord, even as we evangelize. Even when people accept and reject the gospel message, we are doing your will. Father, strengthen us, embolden us, Lord, to live our lives for your glory, to be faithful, Lord, where you have us. Bless us, Lord to respect our bodies, knowing one day, Lord, they will be resurrected. Father, thank you so much uh, for this life that you've given us, especially that life that comes through knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen.